Are the Saints back to their powerhouse ways, or are they going to be left praying for a miracle? Let's talk about it. Let's go. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Dynasty After Dark. I'm your host, Calvin Timms, and I'm back with another breakdown for the New Orleans Saints fantasy outlook for 2024 and beyond. And this is a fun one because, you know, on paper you look at it and you're like, ah, there's really not too many offensive weapons for this team. But digging into it a little bit more, I think it's a little bit more interesting and there's some dynasty gems that you want to stash on your roster. So we're going to talk about that here today. If you're a new listener, thank you guys for checking out this channel. Please subscribe to the channel so you can hear all of our content. Uh, again, sorry for the, the no live last week. Uh, I had a uh, man surgery that, uh, you know, it's you, you can only get it once, but the good news is I will not have to worry about ever having kids again, so there's that. Uh, but I was not feeling too good for the weekend. It was a, a long weekend for that. So, that said, we're going to be back to the regular schedule this week, and uh, I'm excited. We got a lot of content for you guys planned, so it'll be a good week. Make sure you guys subscribe to the channel to hear all of our content. Please like the video as well. If you like this kind of content, it helps us out with our feedback so we know what content you guys do like to see. And if you can, leave a comment down below and just let me know how you think about these players and if there's any teams that you want me to break down next i've gone through a few of the interesting teams there's a few that i just don't want to do you know because it's kind of boring like i was thinking about doing the new york giants for example and it's like malik neighbors is probably the only fantasy relevant player on that entire team even daniel jones if he kind of bounces back a little bit i don't know if it's long term so I'm not going to waste a whole video on the New York Giants because it'd be one of the shortest of all time. And uh, yeah, it's just kind of a waste of a filler episode. So would rather do teams that are a little bit more interesting like the New Orleans Saints. So again, if you like this kind of content, leave a like down below and uh, yeah, let me know what team you want to hear next. There's still a few that I want to get to and uh, we'll have some fun over the next couple of weeks. But yeah, your feedback is always appreciated. So that said, you can follow me over on Twitter at TDC underscore Calvin. You can leave me a comment over there as well. Any fantasy-related questions that you guys have for your rosters or anything like that, hit us up over there. I do do a uh, roster breakdown, so if you want to get a full look at your roster and, and kind of my expert opinion on it, I do it completely free of charge, no extra money. I know there's people out there that charge a ton of money. Maybe I'm an idiot for not doing it, but... You know, this is for you guys. I, I never started this to become a billionaire, right? I just wanted to have a good time talking fantasy football. So if you're looking for some some roster advice, hit me up over on Twitter at TDC underscore Calvin, and I would be happy to give you guys some advice or leave it down in the YouTube comments down below. Now let's get into this and let's break down a few of the players here for the New Orleans Saints, starting with the quarterback, Derek Carr. Now I... Famously, have never been a Derek Carr fan. I, I think he's very overrated. And if you look at his game log, he has literally only one time back in 2016 been a top 12 dynasty quarterback. Now, obviously, this depends a little bit on your league settings and whether or not um, you have six point, you know, how heavily the interceptions are rated and everything like that. But you know, kind of the more standard vanilla quarterback scoring. He's only been a top 12 guy one time, but he's never one time been outside of the top 24. So he's kind of Mr. Consistent. He's good, but not great for your fantasy roster. And I do think that it's going to be like that yet again. I actually think this is going to be a better year for him. He's only 33 years old and it feels like he's been around forever, but there, and he kind of has, you know, he's been around since 2014. He's been in the league for 10 years, came out as 23. So the good news is quarterbacks kind of play for a longer time now than they ever have in the past. So he still has probably another four years left before he really starts to fall off athletically. Questionable whether or not he's going to be there mentally. I, I don't think Derek Carr is the uh, the best quarterback to lead your system in the NFL, but 
for the next couple of years, I do think that he's going to ride it out with the Saints. They don't really have a lot of options, especially given the salary cap issues that they have every single year. They already extended Derek Carr. They like restructured his contract. So next year, I think if you were to cut him, it's going to be a massive loss of money. They're already over the cap. Again, so it's not going to happen. And I was thinking about this the other day. If you're an older player that wants a guaranteed contract for the rest of your career, go sign a contract with the Saints, man, because they are going to give you decent money, and then they're going to backload it, and then they're going to restructure it every single year so they can never cut you. So it's great because you can get extensions and you can get uh, you can get restructured every single year if you're a decent older player. But, man, it's just it's crazy what they do with the salary cap. Here nor there. But Derek Carr in 2024, I think, is going to be much better. Now, the reason why I think he's going to be better than he was last year, finishes the quarterback number 16, 375 completions for almost 4,000 yards, just a tad under in a whole season played, 17 games, 25 touchdowns, 8 interceptions, had a little bit of a... Early season hiccup with this offense and kind of the midseason where wasn't able to get on the same page with a lot of his guys. It started off really, really rough. The first four games was just absolutely brutal. First game against Tennessee, Tennessee didn't have a defense, 305 yards, one touchdown, one interception. You're like, oh man, Derek Carr and the Saints, this is going to be something very dangerous. Week number two against Carolina, which is a little bit better of a defense, at the time, 21 completions for 228 yards, no touchdowns, an interception. Against Green Bay, 13 completions for 100 yards, one touchdown. Tampa Bay, 23 completions for 127 yards. Even against New England Week 5, he got saved by the two touchdowns, but 18 completions for 183 yards, just absolutely brutal. Then things started to turn around and things started to click for him. And when you go and look at the way that his season ended last year in 2023, you know, very good run of games where, again, he's not going to be someone who's going to absolutely win you every single week, but he's also someone that's not going to kill you. Four, three of the last four weeks, he had over 20 points in, again, the standard four point quarterback PPR, like standard quarterback settings, right? The only game that he didn't, he had 15 points, which is not terrible. As against Tampa Bay, they kind of had his number the whole time anyway. But 200 yards, two touchdowns in that game. The downside with Derek Carr is he's not really a mobile threat. He has only broken 100 and yards about three times, all with the Raiders, and it was mostly with John Gruden. Everywhere else, he just does not run that much, and he's not that effective at it. But he's... Johnny, he's checked down Charlie, the new check down Charlie King of the NFL. He's going to have around 30 touchdowns. He's going to have around, you know, 10 to 12, maybe 15 interceptions on a high year. And he's going to have around 4,000 yards. And that's just the baseline Derek Carr. And this year, I think it's going to be a little bit better because when you go back to last year, just one other thing to remember is it was the first year with a new system. You know, he, he got he came over from the Raiders, which was uh, what was his name? Um, Daniels, Josh Daniels, McDaniels. Yes, that's it. Uh, um, sorry, it's a little late. But Josh McDaniels was the last year in Vegas with him. Completely fell apart. They cut him after that year for Jimmy Garoppolo, which was like the dumbest transition ever. I just don't, I never understood that whatsoever. So he leaves Las Vegas, comes over to New Orleans. They sign him to a, a four-year deal, lots of money, $40 million a year, I think, was the contract. Then again, he got restructured already this year. But it was his first year in that system. And first year with Chris Olave, with Rashid Shahid, with Alvin Kamara, Kendra Miller, all these guys he had no rapport with, right? And he had to build that in the season where... The guys in, in Las Vegas, the you know, it kind of changed every single year, but he had he knew a lot of those players for multiple seasons. So it was a little bit more consistent year to year. So the fact that he almost had four thousand yards last year, I think was a good testament to this system. I think it's gonna fit him very well. And you have that year two bump in this offense, and I think it's gonna be very good for this team as a whole. You couple that with the fact that last year the the Saints had a a you know franchise 
defining bad offensive line. Like they are known when you think about the New Orleans Saints, very good defense, very good offensive line for many, many years. Always like one or two targets in this entire offense that are fantasy relevant, everything like that, but generally a very strong offensive line. And it fell off a bridge last year. It was absolutely terrible. So they went and drafted an offensive tackle, uh, Talisi Fuanga, the left tackle, um, I think out of Tennessee is where he was from. But they drafted him at 14 overall. A lot of people were thinking that they could go quarterback, they could trade up, they could take wide receiver. They were kind of open with their choices, and they decided to invest in the offensive line for their car and it's going to be a big improvement where that was like the biggest weakness was that left side so they're investing in it they're trying to make that better and I do think that Fuanga is going to make this a better offensive line so you shore that up a little bit Derek Carr is going to be better in year two and I think he's in line to be a fantasy sleeper which is if you know me and if you know how much I hate Derek Carr that's a big bold statement because I just don't like him very much and then when you couple that with his fantasy value I just think that you know he's one of the best sleeper picks for quarterback right now and you know I'm just pulling up his his fantasy value currently ranked as the quarterback number 33 never finished outside the top 24 in a super flex he's valued as the 302 303 um I actually am thinking about this I might go send a couple of offers in leagues where I need a quarterback because it's just absolutely free man for good production so Derek Carr definite going to be a year two bump in this offense and you can let me know down below if I'm wrong but I do like his potential this year now keep in mind Derek Carr he's not the best he has weak losing weeks in season but you know he does have weak winning ones as well where he's not going to be the number one guy but he'll be top five top eight in a few weeks out of the year so He's a good player, and uh, yeah, I actually think that Derek Carr is is slowly becoming a value for me in Dynasty, which is absolutely insane because I just I never liked the value on Derek Carr, and he's finally gotten there. So there's the quarterback position. Let's switch over to the receiver position really quickly. I'm going to save the running backs for last year. And you look at the receivers, and this is where it is a little bit more straightforward. Chris Olave, I think he's in line for a massive season. Last year finished as the wide receiver number 16, 138 targets for 87 receptions and 1,100 yards, five touchdowns. I think it's absolutely crazy that he struggled a lot. Him and Derek Carr were not on the same page for most of the season. Again, they didn't really have that rapport. They had to build it in season, figure out how each other played. But they were able to figure it out down the stretch. The early season was pretty rough. Um, Now, obviously, Chris Olave was fine because he's a monster. But I do think Chris Olave is about to flip a switch and he's going to go absolutely nuclear this year. I'm thinking he's going to be around wide receiver number eight. I think he's going to be in line for, even if it's the same number of targets, that is a very bad and poor reception percentage right catch percentage where you're talking about roughly 60 percent you know 65 percent completion you know reception percentage which for Chris Olave I think he's much better than that you look at the year before right his rookie season 119 targets 72 catches which you know I don't know the mental math of that off the top of my head but it's about 75 percent give or take 70 percent So obviously a major tick up there. So if he gets the same number of targets, you're talking about around 100 receptions and probably 1,400 yards just because of how good he is after the catch, 1,300 to 1,400 yards, maybe seven or eight touchdowns. That's top 10. That's definitely top 10 wide receiver. And I think that he's in line with that, especially with some of the changes that we've seen from these other teams and the other guys, you know, like DJ Moore, for example. I know a lot of people are down on DJ Moore with the rookie Caleb Williams, but he was top 10 last year. And all of a sudden you can see another spot for Chris Olave to go and fill. So I think Chris Olave is about to go nuclear, and he's kind of the really the only one you want in this offense. If you're going to take a stab at another guy, Rashid Shahid is the guy you want to own. Um, 
75 targets last year for 46 catches. Again, there was a lot of of blown plays with him and Derek Carr. Now, this guy is a guy that I'd be a lot more comfortable with in best ball. If you're doing those best ball manias and stuff like that, he's going to be someone that is going to be a weak winner because he just absolutely pops off. You know, week week number eight against Indianapolis, three for three for 153 yards and a touchdown, just randomly out of nowhere. He followed that up with a three for three for 22 yards, no touchdown. So 25 points one week, five points the next, seven points the week after that, three points the week after that. And then he goes on for 18, three, 15. So like he's a very inconsistent player. He's a, he's a deep threat bomb when he can get those open down the field. He's absolutely insane. So I do like that option with Rashid Shahid, but it's more of a best ball format that I'd be interested in him. Um, and then the other player, if you're going to take a stab on anybody, it's going to be A.T. Perry. Now, he didn't play for most of the start of the year. He didn't start until week 10, had the bye week in week 11, uh, and then started to play after that in week 12. Only had 18 total targets last year, 12 catches for 250 yards. Absolutely nasty down the field threat. He busted off some big runs, four touchdowns on 12 receptions insane the dude really is a good player I liked him a lot coming out the year before when he got drafted so I think that he's someone that's a little bit of a sleeper player to take that number two position for this team Rashid Jaheed's always going to be kind of a deep threat for this team but if you're going to get somebody that's going to be more of an outside player to play with Chris Olave. A.T. Perry is the guy that I would be taking a stab on just to see. He's big. He's six foot five, 205 pounds. So, you know, Rashid Shahid, for example, he's six foot 180. He's, he's a smaller speed guy. A.T. Perry is a big body guy, and I, I kind of like that a lot. Again, pairing that with what he was doing coming out of Wake Forest, and I think there's some potential there if you're going to stash somebody on this team. So A.T. Perry is a name to keep on your radar. Uh, Juwan Johnson, the tight end, is another name that that people are going to bring up, I know, but I just don't really care. 59 targets last year for 37 catches, 368 yards, four touchdowns. You can do much better at tight end, even in a crappy tight end landscape. I just, I'm not that excited about it. I don't think he's that good of a player as it is. All right, now I saved the best for last. I wanted to talk about the two running backs, the two main running backs. People are very excited about Alvin Kamara. Now, obviously last year, the season started, Alvin Kamara was suspended for the first three seasons, comes in in week four, and just starts to go absolutely nuclear in the passing game. Um, The dude had 86 targets for 75 catches from Derek Carr for 466 yards. So he did nothing with these catches. Like, that is a very, very poor uh, receiving line for that many targets and receptions. Only one receiving touchdown. Then you pair that with the rushing production. And this is where, again, the offensive line did him no favors. Still finished as a top 12 running back last year with these numbers just because of the PPR value of 75 receptions. But 180 attempts for 694 rushing yards, five rushing touchdowns. And he played a bulk of the season and bulk of the snaps because Kendra Miller was injured for most of the year. And this is where I think that there's a little bit of a buy window on um, Kendra Miller right now. And I'm just pulling up the prices of both of these players because Kendra Miller, he played a little bit early on in the season, but, you know, 34% of snaps, 8%, you know, 36, 32 Three fourteen gets injured again and comes back, plays thirty six percent of the snaps against Atlanta in the final week, and goes for thirteen carries for seventy three yards, one touchdown, one catch for one yard, or sorry, one catch for six yards, and uh, no touchdown. So very hit or miss player, Kendra Miller. We knew he was banged up coming out of the draft last year going into training camp and everything like that looks like he never fully got healthy very explosive player coming out of tcu i like the potential of this guy quite a bit i think he has very good hands and given how their car has shown that he likes to target the running back position there's a lot of value in that 
if Kendra Miller can get the field. I don't know for a fact if he can, but you know, looking at everybody else in this offense and what they were able to do, it just was not that exciting. Jamal Williams did had a lot of work last year. He had 106 carries for 300 yards, averaged 2.8 yards per carry. Meanwhile, Kendra Miller, you know, banged up or not, had a 3.8 yards per carry average with almost half of the carries, right? So he was much more efficient with much less work, and he's got better hands, I believe, than Jamal Williams as well. He's much younger, 22 years old. Jamal's 29. Alvin Kamara is 28. Now, Alvin Kamara is going to be with the team at least for this year because of the salary cap issues that I mentioned at the top of the video. I think he's going to be a fine PPR play for fantasy football in this season, but I am still in on Kendra Miller and his long-term value. You know, Alvin Kamara is valued right now at the 204, 205. He's behind guys like DeAndre Swift. Um, he's he's pretty much even with Najee Harris at running back 22. Um, Kamara's running back number 21. Very old. 29 years old for a running back is not very sexy in today's market. People don't want to invest in running backs as it is, let alone 29 year old running backs. Um, you know, I'd rather have Derrick Henry than Alvin Kamara, for example, at very similar prices. Right. Um, so Alvin Kamara, he's not someone that's going to be exciting to go and get. I do think he's going to be very valuable. So if you do have Alvin Kamara and you're making a, a run at the title, I don't think he's going to get the same total usage because I do think that Kendrick Miller is going to be utilized a lot more this year. But I think that he's going to he's going to have weeks where he's going to absolutely pop off. If he has a week where he has 14 targets and 13 catches, like it does not matter if those 13 catches were for 33 yards. Like that's so terrible, man. 13 catches in PPR league, that's 13 points right there for no yards after that. You, you had a baseline of basically 13 there. But, um, yeah, it's just very valuable to have that much usage in the passing game. Where I think Kendra Miller is going to come in and, and kind of have a bigger role is going to be in the rushing side. I do think that they're going to utilize Kendra in the receiving game. But this year I think that you're going to see a little bit more of a split between these two guys. You know, 1A, 1B in this offense. I'm projecting Kendra Miller for around 150 to 180 carries this year, um, probably around 40 targets, maybe 30 catches. I don't know the touchdowns. It's hard to predict. I don't know the the total volume. If you're talking 100 and let's say it's 160 carries, if he's averaging four per, you're talking around what is that? What would that be? About 650 yards. So it's not going to be league winning this year, but where I like Kendra Miller a lot is going to be the long term, right? Because Alvin Kamara is basically playing his final year in New Orleans. I think in 2025, his contract is very, very heavy and they can get out of it for almost no money. So it's finally the window where they can cut Alvin Kamara and save a ton of money. Now, they might always restructure him, resign him, whatever, but who knows what's going to happen there. But I just don't see that being the case because of how much they're already over the cap. Now, in the summer of 2024, they're going to have to do so much to get under the cap, right? And why would you sign a 30-year-old running back at that point in time? It just doesn't make a ton of sense logistically for this team, um, especially if, like, I think it's going to happen. I think Dennis Allen's going to get fired this year, and they're going to have a whole new regime coming in. And that's where Kendra Miller, you know, they didn't draft him, but I think they're going to be able to see the talent on the field, and that's where in two years' time, you know, in 2025, you're going to see a big breakout from Kendra Miller in 2025, and if anything were to happen to Alvin Kamara this year, I think you're going to see a massive breakout from Kendra Miller. He's too talented, and for 301, 302 value, you know, he's going behind guys like, he's going behind Nick Chubb, and I like Nick Chubb. 
but Nick Chubb is currently uh, 20, almost 29 years old, 28 and a half, right? He'll be 29 this year, coming off one of the most brutal knee injuries we've ever seen, and he's going ahead of Kendra Miller. Like, what are we doing, guys? What are we doing? I get it. It's good opportunity with Cleveland, but Nick Chubb's never going to be the same guy again. Like, it, that's over. That is completely over. Uh, he's going behind, you know, Jalen Wright, the the running back for, uh, I think it's Tennessee, right? Um, who does he play for? Jalen Wright plays for... Oh, Miami. That's right. He, yes, Miami. He was the guy that they took pretty early in the third round, I believe. Um, I forgot about that. For some reason, I was thinking it was Tennessee. Um, oh, Tajay Spears is Tennessee. See? It's late, guys. What did I tell you? But... Jalen Wright, I mean, why are we taking Jalen Wright, who has one of the most crowded backfields? They have Raheem Mostert. They signed him to a two-year extension. They have Devin Achain, Achan, whatever the hell his name is, and Jalen Wright. Like, it's just, I get it's a good opportunity, but I don't know. I don't think it's going to be weekly winning value from Jalen Wright. Whereas Kendra Miller, all he needs is the opportunity, and I think he gets there 100%. So, um yeah, I like I like Kendra Miller, and I don't think that we should be completely writing him off like a lot of in the fantasy community are doing right now. You know, again, you go back to to last year. He was my number three running back in that class. Didn't get to do much on the field, but that last week against Atlanta, he showed the potential. Right, thirteen carries for seventy three yards and a touchdown. You know, he's just he's very explosive when he gets out there and gets to play with you know, without being banged up the entire time. So improvements to the offensive line, improvements to the usage in Kendra Miller, and I could easily see him, again, if they want to make Alvin Kamara the primary back at 29 years old, that's entirely possible, but I'm projecting low on Kendra Miller at 160 carries. If he gets up there to around 200, which is entirely possible, let's say that, you know, maybe he's around 200. Alvin Kamara takes a little bit of a step back. He's around 140, but they still use Kamara as the the receiving back, and he gets around 90 targets again. Both of these guys can be relevant for fantasy football. So a lot of opportunity in New Orleans and outside of Chris Olave. I think that there is a little bit of value. I'm not paying a second-round pick, though, for Alvin Kamara. No chance in hell. I'd rather, you know, pair a second and a third or two seconds together and go get Derrick Henry over Alvin Kamara. I think the upside is way too high there. But if you can give me Kendra Miller for a third round pick, that's really hard to pass up, especially given how everybody needs running backs in fantasy football. So again, thank you guys for checking this out. Let me know your thoughts down below if I'm an idiot, if I'm overlooking the value of Alvin Kamara, or if I'm just, you know, Hopium on Kendra Miller. I I get it. I can have these uh, these blinders on because I did like him last year, but I'm trying to be objective with it. And I'm trying to you know take my personal biases out of it. I do think that the opportunity is there, and I'm projecting low on him, but I think that it's it's in his hands. All he has to do is grab it. So I believe in the talent of the player. So you can let me know if I'm an idiot down below, but. Any comments are appreciated. Again, like this video if you like this kind of content. Tell me who you want me to break down next, and I'm open to suggestions. So thank you guys again for checking this video out. And until next time, have a good night. And we all got dreams. We all want things. But what you gonna do for it? How you gonna move for it? What you gonna be?